Hey guys, it's Mr. Kenny. I'm back with video 26. We're going to be talking about symbiosis and ecological succession. Alright, first of all, let's talk about community interactions. There are basically three types of community interaction you can have. First is competition. Competition occurs when one, one organism attempts to use the same ecological resource. You know, I, I classically say that if we were trapped in a room and we had a limited amount of food and um, a bag of Doritos appear, we would compete for that bag of food. But now if you were at home and you had no one to compete, no one there was competing with you for food and the bag of Doritos appeared, uh, competition would not be as fierce. You know, you can think of it in the natural kingdom. Um, whenever there becomes a drought situation and there becomes water becomes scarce, uh, animals start to compete around a watering hole and competition becomes more and more fierce as the water hole gets smaller and smaller. The next one is predation. Predation is when one organism captures and feeds on another organism. This is going to really, really show how organisms interact with one another. Uh, and the other one is symbiosis. Symbiosis is when two organisms or two species live very closely together. All right. First of all, let me talk about the predator one. Predator-prey relationships, you'll often see, predator-prey relationships are pretty easy to understand. Uh, up here on the graph, I have uh, a hare and a lynx. Hare is a rabbit, and the lynx is like a, a big cat, a, a bobcat of some sort. Well, if you'll notice, as the number of hares go up, the number of lynx go up because they've got a lot of food, right? So they start to produce a lot of lynx. As the number of lynx goes up, the number of hares come down. Why? Because there's a lot of things eating them. Well, if the food source goes down, the number of predators will start to also go down. They start to die off. As you get a low number of predators, the number of prey start to go back up. It's a continuous cycle up and down. So be able to identify that. There's a lot of examples. One I really like down here that I have written is pandas and eucalyptus trees. You wouldn't think of pandas being predators on eucalyptus trees as the prey, but it really is. As the number of pandas increased, the number of eucalyptus trees would go down because they're getting eaten so severely by the, the pandas. So it's, it's a correlation like anything else. Now the next one's probably one of my favorite ones to talk about. And it's symbiosis. Now when you talk about symbiosis, there are three types of symbiosis. The first one is mutualism. Mutualism is where both organisms benefit in some way. Uh, I've got a picture over here of a clownfish and a sea anemone. The sea anemone, I don't know what, if you know about, what you know about it, but the sea anemone has poisonous tentacles. And um, the clownfish is immune to these poisonous tentacles, and the, but the clownfish is very tiny, usually only about an inch or an inch and a half long, and it's bright orange, so it's like, come out here and eat me. So how do these two organisms benefit from each other? Well, the sea anemone gives the clownfish protection. Nothing's going to come mess with the little fellow when his big buddy's around. The sea anemone gets out of the deal is the clownfish inevitably leaves the sea anemone to go find food. And when it comes back to the sea anemone, there will be something chasing it or there could be something chasing it. So the sea anemone gets brought food to, to the house or, or carry out, you know, to the house. So they both benefit in some way. Now the next one is commensalism. Commensalism is when one benefits and the other is neither help nor harm. I've got a picture of an egret and a rhino over here. The egret sits on top of the rhino's back. The, the rhino really doesn't get anything out of, out of the relationship. I mean, it might get some type of back massage, but that's about it. The, sea, the, the egret, what he gets out of the deal is protection, first of all. Who's going to come in and mess with this bird that's sitting on the back of the rhino? But mainly what it does, it sits on the back of the rhino, and it looks behind it and watches the rhino step. As the rhino steps, his foot goes down into the soil, and there'll be insects and other types of bugs that come up out of the ground and the egret jumps down and eats them and jumps back on top of the rhino. It's kind of like if you've ever seen anybody diss in a field and you've seen uh, seagulls following them behind. That's kind of what the egret's doing with the uh, rhino. The third one is parasitism. Parasitism is when one benefits and the other is harmed. Now, you, you can think of a parasite, of course. Um, I use for North Carolina here, we have tobacco worms. And tobacco worms have a parasitic wasp that comes up and lays eggs. And here's a picture of it. You know, the wasp, what it gets is the, the, the tobacco worm carries around its eggs. When the eggs hatch, they turn into small larvae. 
that bore into the uh, tobacco worm and actually eat the juice out of the tobacco worm. And when they mature, they explode out of the tobacco worm. As you can see, this is probably not very beneficial to the, the worm. Uh, the, the, the parasitic wasp gets an all-you-can-eat buffet where the worm gets killed, right? The tobacco worm dies. So that would be an example of parasitism. So you need to know mutualism, both benefit. Commensalism, one benefits, one's harmed. And parasitism, one benefits, and the other... Excuse me, commensalism, one benefits... <coughs> excuse me. One benefits, and the other's neither help nor harm. And parasitism is when one benefits and the other is harmed. Here's three pictures that I have. Um, you can guess which one is mutualism by looking. Uh, I would say probably mutualism is here. They're both benefiting. Uh, which one is commensalism? You would only be able to know, if I, know that one if I told you really. But in this case, um, this fellow gave this guy some of his food because he wasn't going to eat it all. And then, of course, the last one over here, you can see parasitism is over here on this one. He's stealing his food. All right. Now, let's shift gears just a minute. Let's talk about ecological succession. Now, when you see the word succession, you should be thinking about a step-by-step -step change. I usually think of the king and queen of England. You know, when the queen dies, the prince will take over. When the prince dies, the princess will be their own down the line. Well, this actually happens in nature. It's a series of predictable changes that occurs in the community over time. Ultimately, you're trying to reach what's called a climax community, a, a final ending point. And climax communities will change depending on the environment that you're in. But there are two types of succession. There is primary succession, which is here. It starts at the very beginning, whenever there was no soil, all right, no soil at all, and you had to start and create soil so the plants could grow. And usually what happens is a pioneering species comes in. A pioneering species, the first one to come into the area, and I usually like to use a lichen, all right. A lichen is kind of like a moss, grows on rock. So if you can think of a lava as it cools, the lichens coming in and they grow. And when they die, their bodies are they're, they're going to have nutrients. They're going to be decomposed and turned back into the soil on top of the lava. As the soil gets thicker, you're going to have larger and larger plants come in. Now realize primary succession to go from the very beginning when no soil is there to a climax community, which is an ultimate community of maybe old hardwood trees. Um, it's going to take a very long time, millions and millions of years. You know, North Carolina, we've not reached our climax communities yet in some of our areas. So uh, realize it, it could still be an ongoing process. The next one is secondary succession. Now, secondary succession means soil's already there, but something happens to stop the process. Usually a natural disaster, a hurricane, a tornado, a flood. Something happens to tear down the trees that are there. Now, I like to think of cutdowns, which are man-made disasters. A cutdown is when, a, when humans go in and cut down the trees to harvest them, and they leave the ground, you know, pretty much just the way it is. And if you've ever been in a cutdown, the first thing that happens is shrubs, grasses, things like that start to grow. Then you have pine trees, maybe one or two oaks or maples. And eventually, you're going to have more amounts of oaks and maples and less amounts of pine trees as it grows upward. That's an example of secondary succession. Not going to take as long. It's going to kind of start in the middle. Now, here's a better picture of it. You can see at the beginning, you got small plants here at the very beginning down here. And as it moves upward, you know, more and more time goes by. You get larger and larger trees. And that's this is... This would be secondary succession. Now, if I added lichens on down here at the bottom, I said to start out with rock, then that would be secondary succession. All right. I hope video 26 has been helpful, and if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask tomorrow.